sorry, good morning, and welcome to the officials from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries and from the Auditor General's Department. My name is David Janat Tanku, and I am the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. Before I introduce or ask the other co my other colleagues to introduce themselves, I would like to start by advising that the Public Accounts Committee has a mandate to consider and to report to the House on A, appropriation accounts of monies expended out of sums granted by Parliament to meet the public expenditure of Trinidad and Tobago, B, such other accounts as may be referred to the Committee by the House of Representatives or as are authorized or required to be considered by the Committee under any other enactment, and C, the report of the Auditor General on any such accounts, and whether policy is carried out efficiently, effectively, and economically, and whether expenditure conforms to the authority which governs it. The purpose of today's meeting is for the Public Accounts Committee to follow up on the implementation of the recommendations made in the 30th report of the Public Accounts Committee with reference to the concerns raised in the report of the Auditor General on the public accounts of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago with specific reference to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries and to determine the challenges being faced by the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries in implementing the Committee's recommendations and treating with the issues raised by the Auditor General. Based on those issues identified, the following key stakeholders were invited to today's session. The Auditor General's Department and the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Please be advised as well that this meeting is being broadcast live on the Parliament's Channel 11 on Radio 105.5 FM and the Parliament's YouTube channel, PowerView. Viewers and listeners are welcome to send their comments related to today's inquiry via email pal101 at ttparliament.org, via facebook.com forward slash ttparliament, and via Twitter at ttparliament. I will now ask my colleagues, members of the committee present here today to introduce themselves, beginning with my colleague on my right, Member John. Good morning. My name is Jillian John, member, vice chairman. Good morning all and welcome. I'm Dr. Imri Brown, a uh, member of the Senate and Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, member of this committee. Good morning all, welcome. Roger Monroe, member of parliament, member. Colleagues. Good morning. Um, my name is Cherie Sipasad. I'm an independent senator and a member of this committee. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ayana Webster Roy, member of the committee. Just for reference, we were also joined with members of the Secretariat who are present with us here today to take notes and to provide guidance going forward. Um, may I also now ask members of the representatives from the Auditor General's Department and from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to introduce themselves. We will begin with the Auditor General. Good morning, all. Shiva Sinanan, Assistant Auditor General from the Auditor General's Department. Good morning, everybody. Mukesh Balji, Auditor General Department. Michelle Superville Craigwell. Auditor Executive One Acting, Auditor General's Department. Thank you. We have the representatives from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Introduce yourselves now. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Penelope Bracho Niles, Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Good morning. I'm Candice de Gil, a manager of energy data operations at the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Good morning, Chairman and members. I am Monty Bihari, Director of Minerals at the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Good morning, Chairman and members. My name is Mark Rudder. I'm the Petroleum Operations Director at the Ministry of Energy 
and energy industries. Thank you all. May I also use this opportunity, so welcome. I may also use this opportunity to afford the Auditor General's Department to make a brief opening statement as we proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries plays a major role in the management of the natural resources of the nation, oil, gas, and aggregate. The nation's main source of revenue is the oil and gas sector. The Auditor General has always been cognizant of the significant significance of the energy industry in our economy. As it just this year gone by produced 53% of our revenue. In this regard, arising out of the last meeting held on the 27th of November 2019, the following areas were examined in more detail. Internal audit, revenue, production, receipts and disbursements. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I invite the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to make a brief opening statement, please? Good morning again, Chairman and the other members of the committee and also to the viewing audience. The Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries is responsible for the overall management of the oil, natural gas and mineral sectors in Trinidad and Tobago. These sectors are significant contributors to the GDP of the country and therefore revenues generated from the energy sector are unarguably critical. The team from the Ministry here today is prepared to provide a status on the implementations of recommendations of the PAC and to provide any clarification that may be necessary to understand the systems utilized by the Ministry in the regulation of the industry. On a continuous basis, we have been focused on optimizing our systems, and since the Ministry last met with the Public Accounts Committee, we have undertaken several initiatives in the area of human resources addressing staffing issues in the mineral sector, including a review of the minerals regulations, and in the oil and gas sector, reviewing our systems and increasing collaboration between divisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. The process we would follow is I would normally introduce um, the first set of questions and then open the floor to my colleagues uh, for various rounds of questions. Um, so allow me to begin, firstly, by expressing my significant concern, having read the report, the 30th report of the Public Accounts Committee, which you referenced earlier. Having read that report, and then having had several attempts to host this um, meeting over the last few months, I must register my grave concern um, that we seem to have the same problem that we did in 2019, which is accessing information from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries by the Public Accounts Committee. That raises a grave concern for us because as a citizen, um, based on what you just said, uh, my colleague at the um, Auditor General's Department has indicated it's 53% of the revenue of Trinidad and Tobago comes from the energy sector, and therefore it is the committee's, it is in the committee's interest to ensure that all concerns and queries and issues and challenges that the ministry may have are addressed as urgently as possible. But there seems to be a, a different challenge. And I want, if I may be allowed to, to read into the record a timeline so that I think members of the, the viewing public and your, your good selves could understand the genesis of my frustration with regards to getting information to the Public Accounts Committee, not just from 2029, which was expressed in the, in the last report, but even today. The following, and I'm reading, I'm reading the report as is, just for the record at this point. The following is a timeline of the PAC's Secretariat's communications with the Ministry of Energy and Indu Energy Industries to request written responses and to schedule a public uh, uh, hearing for this follow-up inquiry. And this is just a follow-up inquiry. This is not the primary inquiry which took place 2018-2019. Uh, this is a follow-up from four years ago. Date, 21st of the 1st, 2022. PAC wrote to the Ministry with a uh, request for written submissions with a deadline of the 4th of the 2nd, 2022. 16th of the 2nd, 2022, a meeting was rescheduled to the 9th of the 3rd, 2022. 7th of the 3rd, 2022, 
Ministry indicated their inability to attend on the meeting of the 9th and requested an extension to the 18th of the 3rd to submit written responses. 8th of the 3rd, 2022, the meeting was rescheduled to the 23rd of the 3rd, 2022. 18th of the 3rd, 2022, meeting rescheduled to the 13th of the 4th, 2022. 13th of the 4th, 2022, meeting postponed. 4th of the 5th, 2022, meeting rescheduled to the 11th of the 5th, 2022, and then postponed. 16th of the 11th, 2022, meeting rescheduled, meeting scheduled for 30th of the 11th, 2022. 30th of the 11th, 2022, meeting rescheduled to the 14th of the 12th, 2022. 14th of the 12th, that particular one was rescheduled on our request because of a sitting of the House of Parliament. 21st of the 12th, 2022, an updated request for written submissions was sent to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries with a deadline of the 6th of the 1st, 2023. That's a substantial amount of uh, attempts by the Secretariat to get information from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. No written submission has been received from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to date. That is today, March 22nd. No written submissions have been received from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to date. Our Secretariat advised that they followed up on the 24th of the 1st, 2023, and throughout February and March 2023. The question I have, therefore, and it is a matter of grave concern because this reflects the exact issues that were raised. I have other members of the, of, of the committee here who were part of this um, fifth session of Parliament. The 30th report was, pre was prepared then. And they said that basically they had the same issues then, where the ministry seems to be lax in, 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 in submitting information. And that's a, an issue of concern, given the importance of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to the national community and to the gross domestic product of this country. My questions. Can you please advise, Madam Permanent Secretary, who is the individual or entity or department responsible for preparing and approving the Ministry's responses to the Committee, to the Public Accounts Committee of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago? Um, Chair, I am the person responsible and I do apologize. Ma'am, can you advise, and, and apology is acceptable, but can you advise why? Because this is a situation that existed in 2019. So we are looking at 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and the issue seems to be the same. We cannot seem to get information from the Ministry of, uh, of Energy and Energy Industries. I don't know if there are specific challenges that you are facing, and if there are, ma'am, the, the purpose of the committee as stated in, our, in my opening statement was to assist the ministry in addressing the very challenges that you may have. So ma'am, can you advise, ma'am, Permanent Secretary, if there are specific challenges and what they are. So thank you very much, um, Chair. And um, I just want to indicate that my records have that we did submit prior to your, um, between 2019 and now, two sets of written submissions. And what we was required over the last year was a follow-up to that. All right, so we did between 2019 and now, we did submit two sets of written information. And so just to clarify that. And that's fine. The references that I was making was from 2022. Yeah. So Right? So they, like, like I said, there are two issues there. One is the failure to come before the committee, uh, which would have dealt with some of the issues that we would want to raise today in any case. But the other one was the issue of not responding to the Secretariat of the Public Accounts Committee. And I referenced 2022 and 2023. So you may have submitted documentation prior to that, mm -hmm. but we were asking for updated information and specific queries were provided which would have informed us today, better informed us today. So we would be in a position, an informed position. It feels, quite frankly, as if the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries does not have regard for the Public Accounts Committee and our request for information. So I just want to say that that is indeed not the case. Um, we have been following up and working on several fronts 
um, just to fulfill the core mandate, which is to increase the revenues and to ensure that the industry was properly managed throughout the course of the COVID. So I don't want to provide any excuses because, of course, reporting to this committee is just as important a mandate. But in terms of challenges, I just want to say that we have been working on several fronts in terms of um, renewable energy, our core business in terms of increasing gas production, looking at the revenues, renegotiating in different areas, and also, of course, the mineral sector. So um, part of the challenges has been, of course, um, having multiple, um, for several of the sessions, multiple engagements at the same time. And therefore, we have been working with Ms. Um, Ms. Jacob Motley in terms of getting a suitable date. But I do want to say that we are here today and um, we are at your full disposal to answer any requests um, or any questions or queries that you may have. Thank you very much, Madam Prime Secretary, and we will hold you to that today. Um, I want to ask just a couple questions at the start. Uh, we have several issues. There are basically two issues that I think we'll be championing today based on the information before us. And one would deal specifically with the, the energy component, and one with, these, with the other side will deal with the quarrying issues. I want to treat, I want to start at the end, which is the quarrying issues. Uh, as somebody who was involved in construction industry for quite a while, I'm aware uh, of reports in the media at least, um, and from suppliers, that there exists a substantial amount of illegal quarrying. On your last time that you were present here, there was an indication that some things were going to be put in place. Unfortunately, as I said, and I will, be, I will belabor the point, we do not have a feedback as to the questions we would have, we would have raised, which is what we, we hope that you will provide some answers for today. Um, but you were supposed to engage in some kinds of activities then, based on the recommendations of the um, Auditor General's reports over the period. You had indicated some aspects, some use of the un unmanned uh, the drones. Um, those things came out of the 2019 documentation. So there was a projection going forward from 2019 that several things were going to be done which will make the issue, this long-standing issue of illegal quarrying, a matter that fetches the full attention of the state and of the relevant uh, security agencies so that we can have dealt with that effectively. I want to use the opportunity and give you the opportunity today and now to provide an information, some sort of information and feedback to your committee and to the, the general public as, well as by extension as to what exactly has been done to treat with this scourge of illegal, illegal quarrying between 2019 and today. Thank you very much, Shay. So we addressed it on several different fronts. The first is that in terms of the actual illegal quarrying, what we have done is increased our collaboration between the different, the Ministry of Energy, the Commissioner of State Lands, and the police, the TTPS, in terms of actually dealing with illegal quarrying on the ground. All right, so that's one area that we address. Another area that we are currently implementing is that we actually went out for a tender to get a survey of the lands, an aerial survey, so that we can look at the lands which are currently under license and thereby, by elimination, be able to determine which are the lands which are illegally quarried. And the letter of award is actually, will be issued today in terms of that. So that's another process that we are going through. So based on our current license and the information that we have internally, we will be able to determine if we are seeing areas that are quarried and it's not Within the license area, we will know that they are illegally quarried, and therefore we'll be able to identify that. So that's another area that we have addressed. 
The third area that we have worked um, really um, hard on since 2020 is looking at the whole areas of licensing of quarries. And with that, what we have done is that we have reviewed the regulations in terms of streamlining the actual um, process for applications and renewals of applications. And we came up with a comprehensive list of recommendations in terms of areas of the regulations to be revised. And that is currently before the LRC. And we expect uh, during 2023 that we will be able to streamline the licensing of quarries um, based on the, the recommendations that we have made for changes to mineral regulations. So those are the three very broad areas that we think would have a significant impact on illegal quarrying in Trinidad and Tobago. I can, if you have further questions, I will ask the Director of Minerals to give more details. Sorry. So in 2019, you had indicated uh, a desire to have this increased collaboration. And you have indicated that you have, in fact, done so at this point. You've set up an agency of some sort where we have all these players at the same desk. On the basis of that interaction and that uh, combined effort from the various state agencies and the police service, can you advise whether anybody has been charged with illegal quarrying to date? Has there been any instance where there have been legal action pending against illegal quarrying? Transfers. Chair, yes, based on the information that uh, we would have received from the multi-agency task force, uh, the multi-agency task force is a task force that was set up by the Commissioner of Police in around October 2019, comprising members of the TTPS, members of the Defence Force, as well as members of several of the key ministries involved with responsibility for land, etc. Uh, there have been persons, based on complaints received of illegal corin, uh, that were investigated, caught in the act, and the TTPS officers are currently dealing with those persons at various stages. Yes, that is the information I would have received from the TTPS. Sorry, I'm trying to gauge the extent of the illegal activity compared to the legal activity. So can you give us an indication of how many persons have been charged and how many quarries have been deemed illegal and therefore their operations ceased. Okay, I don't have that specific information at this point, but we can provide that to you. Right. No, that's the response I was hoping not to get. And the reason for that is our own experience of not getting information forthcoming from the ministry. So if I may, again, just to tie you because we are now in public, can you give me a time frame within which that information can be presented to your committee? Okay, I will have to communicate with the head of the multi-agency task force and obtain that information. I would not like to give you a specific time frame as the information would reside with the TTPS, but as soon as we receive the information, we will forward it to the committee. Thank you. Uh, you also had indicated previously, so, so just for clarification, there have been instances when quarries have been deemed illegal or illegally in operation and have been stopped from continuing operation. Am I correct to say that? Yes, the, the multi-agency task force would have addressed some of those issues. All right. I will open the floor and let my other colleagues because I know this is a topical issue and other colleagues may have questions that you would want to ask. Colleagues? This one particularly, but so if anyone else on the committee wants to do that, I want to ask on a different area, please. 
Yes, please. Ambassador Passat. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just help me to understand. Is it that you haven't been taking photographs, aerial photographs, of the topography of Trinidad and Tobago periodically and comparing it to see um, changes that could point you to illegal quarry, well, legal and illegal quarrying that you all would review on a periodic basis and then send people out to investigate um, what the findings are, etc. Yes, through you, Chair. The aerial photography, and that's a specific thing itself, the, the last record of aerial photography taken by the Director of Surveys goes back to 40, 2014. Uh, we at the Ministry of Energy do not have the technology to take aerial photographs, and that's why we have to outsource that. We, however, use uh, Google Earth, which is basically free software. The challenge with that is we don't have control over the, the dates that the images are taken, so we basically use free available images, but limited by the, the dates that are available. So we have been using Google Earth. We have been looking at the changes of the topography as well as the, the extent of quarrying, and we have been guided by that for our investigations and for monitoring of valid quarries. So we have been using technology of that nature. The, the survey, the aerial survey that Piers mentioned, is for us to establish a baseline as of now, 2023, once this is conducted, of all the areas in Trinidad with legal quarrying as well as the areas that can be deemed illegal so we can then have that baseline to move forward with. That would help us to address many of the questions raised in these um, documents as to what is the extent of illegal quarrying, the estimated revenue possibly lost. Once we have that data, it should be able to assist us with some of that. I don't want to belabor the point, but I was here in 2019 when um, we interviewed the Ministry of Energy and you told us the same thing. Basically, that you're going to get the drone um, technology, etc., and we're now in 2023, and we still haven't had um, this system, software, whatever, um, in place. Could you tell us why it's taking so long for it to to be obtained? So we, as I said, the the difference between 2019 and now is that we actually have the letter of award so that that work will begin shortly, um, very shortly. So it is, it is being implemented. Um, the other thing, as I said, that we did is that we also focused on um, addressing some areas in terms of the regulations as well. So in 2020, we spent quite a bit of time doing the review of the regulations and the other aspect that we worked on between 2020 and 2021 was actually the operational side of it, which is um, looking at the strategies that we could engage with the TTPS. So all of those were areas of focus that we, we also addressed and um, also, well, it was during the time of the COVID as well. So all of that was being done during the last three years. But it is being operationalized at this point in time, and we are moving forward with it. I just want to also add one of the things that um, we are also looking at. Um, I've just begun discussions with other agencies. Um, some of our state agencies is using satellite data. So there's an option that exists, and, and we will start exploring that. So maybe um, during the course of this year, we may be able to um, use that not just for minerals, but also for the oil and gas side. So that's another area that we are using, looking at technology to address. But you do realize um, it's five years we're talking about, four to five years, and therefore millions of dollars have been lost in revenue that we could have gotten from the quarrying activities. And if we had moved a little faster to get the technology in place, that's, that's just one of my major mm -hmm. concerns is the leakage of, of revenue that is due, legally due to the country. Yes, the, the, the thing about it is that the, with the illegal quarrying, the, those are not licensed quarries, so really it is to stop the operations 
of those. So in terms of the focus for the illegal quarrying, the other areas that are licensed um, or in the process of being renewed, those are the ones that we will actually get the, the revenue from. And so we've been focusing also, you know, in terms of increasing our operations and making sure that, you know, we, we do due diligence in that area. No, mm -hmm. no, I'm focusing on illegal. Illegal, yeah. Because mm -hmm. what it is, is you're depriving the country from assets that, that is being put into a place that they have no control or no access to. Mm -hmm. And will never be able to, to, to have access to it. Yeah, so in terms of the illegal quarrying, as I said, while we may not have had the aerial um, the aerial photography for that period, we have been responding to reports um, because we do have our mineral staff on the ground as well as we would have members of the public or other quarry operators which will report to us instances and once that happens or if we get any indication that there's illegal quarrying in any areas we would have responded um, by liaising with the TTPS or sometimes other agencies would report um, you know and so in terms of the actual addressing the illegal quarrying that has been a focus during the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you Jim. Sure member Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Pearson team, for being here today and answering our questions and providing information to the public at large. Um, I know research and development, you place, place a high priority on that at the ministry. What I wanted to get a sense of, over the last fiscal year, um, what investment would have been made by your ministry into um, research into technology or te new technology or techniques that will assist in locating illegal illegal quarries and to put an end to illegal quarry. Please, thanks. So thank you very much for that um, question. Uh, so we do have, so during the course of even the review of, and I'll go back a little further than the one year, because during the review of the minerals regulations, we did do extensive research as well as part of the background for that. And so we looked at other jurisdictions um, and some of the training that the staff would have undergone, they would have also highlighted areas. And I think we, the satellite um, technology, as I said, is one of the areas that we are looking into. Um, some of our state agencies are utilizing it for other areas, such as methane and so on. And we see that it can be used also. We think there's a possibility, so we are exploring that. So over the last year, um, those are the areas that we have been focusing on in terms of technology. I don't know if the director has any others that he wants to. Yes, that is correct. Um, our core focus has been using remote sensing techniques, which would be satellite imagery. And many of our staff members who are trained in geomatics engineering are very good in those areas. What that does is it prevents us from exposing our staff to many of the risks involved in dealing with illegal corn, for instance, if they are physically on the ground every day. So by using these remote sensing techniques, we are able to identify what's happening, and then we can send this information to the multi-agency task force for investigation and action. And that is where the police comes in, because we don't arrest persons. We don't charge persons. We don't prosecute them through course. That's the job of the police, and that's where the police on the multi-agency task force comes in. Investment at the ministry, what, can you give me like a quantum, you would have invested this amount in the last couple of years in terms of research? Yeah, so I'm not more in research, but more in terms of training. So yeah, we, um, we, I don't, I can't say specifically for the, the minerals, but in terms of the GIS and other technical areas, um, on average, I think um, the ministry as a total, because all of our technical staff are involved, I think it would be close to maybe a million dollars we have spent in terms of training overall, and that includes all of the technical areas, including the minerals. So we, we do spend quite a bit in terms of training. Allow me to just jump in with, with uh, a follow-up with, with, with regards to this question. It seems to be, um, but let me premise that with this. The 
quarrying industry has been with us for decades and decades and decades and decades. Technology has been with us for decades and decades and decades and decades as well. It concerns me, it worries me greatly that what we heard today so far, and I'm hoping that there's, there's further clarification, is that you are maybe, and that's the phrase you use, that's the word you use, you are maybe considering the use of the satellite imagery um, that your other colleagues are doing. I've been in construction for quite a while, as I indicated before, and there are geotechnical surveys that will give you different levels and different stratas and so on and so on. So that the risks that you're describing, that uh, Mr. Bihari is describing, um, and there are real risks, there are real security risks for staff going into these areas. But the use of that technology in a small country like Trinidad should be a, a done deal. It should have existed before. We are now appearing to be taking baby steps forward in a multi-million dollar industry where the state and the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago have been denied access to substantial amount of funds that is going to fund persons involved in illegal activity. And I don't get that the ministry is aggressively pursuing these, the use of available technology, especially, I mean, you may, you may say that you're starting to do this now. You are now engaging a contractor, a letter of award going out today. We have been in this industry for decades. Illegal quarrying didn't start today. It's been here for decades. Ministry has been in charge of quarrying for decades from time immemorial, and still it does not seem that we have put sufficient emphasis um, on dealing with the scourge of illegal quarrying. The technology is available. What is preventing? I'm very worried to hear that the, uh, my colleague, Member Webster Roy, asked about the quantum. And I'm hoping that she was trying to, I think she was trying to give you an option, an opportunity to say that you spent this much money on research, this much money on development, so that you would have been able to put us at ease and the national community at ease that illegal quarrying will soon be a thing of the past. And the risks associated with the illegal activity and the criminals associated with illegal quarrying would have been addressed. But you did not say that. One million dollars certainly not is maybe sufficient for training, one million per year, I'm assuming. But it is not enough, certainly, for one moment, please. It's not enough, certainly, for the purpose of purchasing and utilizing appropriate technology to prove to, to, to identify the illegal quarrying and legal quarrying, which we'll get to in a few minutes, but to treat with the activity directly, to be able to target those persons involved in illegal activity. I am very concerned that not enough is being done or not an enough aggression is being put in place, especially given that the, the Auditor General's Department has raised this very sad issue since way before 2019. It's been raised on several reports that I've seen so far, and 2019 was just the last one because we treated with that in, in 2019. Member Brown, I think you wanted to, to add in. So Chair, it's, it's just a general observation. First of all, to add my, my voice uh, to the general expressions of concern on this particular issue but also to remind the committee and those appearing before it that there is a standing committee on energy uh, within the parliamentary system. And so our concern really would be following up on the recommendations and findings of the Auditor General. So I know the, the passion is high uh, and it's an opportunity to ask some broad questions as to the strategy of the ministry in treating with this issue, but it's always just to bear in mind as a background the specific mandate of the committee and the focus on the the auditor general's recommendations and findings. So, chair, this if, is if not this comment is not to curtail your your commentary that you would have just engaged, but just as a general guide and sharing my own perspective as to the scope and breadth of Thank our you. own examination. Thank you. And I, I do have some, some follow-up uh, questions. But, but allow me to well. respond to that yeah. question. The issue of illegal quarrying is in fact a matter that was raised by the Auditor General's report. 
It was, in fact, a matter that was raised at the 30th report of the Public Accounts Committee in 2019, and therefore the questions being asked with regards to illegal quarrying fall squarely in line with the mandate of this Public Accounts Committee. I'm aware that there is a standing committee on other matters. I'm, I'm absolutely aware of that. But I am dealing specifically, we as a committee here are within our mandate to question the ministry with regards to illegal quarrying, and these are the very same individuals who will be present at, even at that standing committee. So allow me to continue, uh, continue Chair, to question Again, I, it's not by way of interruption, but I don't think we should dismiss the role and mandate of other committees within the parliamentary no system. No one is dismissing any yes. mandate, sir. The questions that are being asked today fall squarely within the authority that has been assigned to the Public Accounts Committee. As I am repeating, these very same individuals are the ones who will be present at that standing committee. Can we move on, please, with questions for the individuals present before us? Well, Chair, if, if we've concluded that aspect, I do have a general question in keeping with the mandate of this committee, and I would wish to direct it to the Permanent Secretary. Uh, this is an interesting conversation because, in a sense, we are looking back in time at uh, recommendations and reports made by the Auditor General some years ago and questioning your entities and your divisions with respect to work done and follow-up in implementation or lack thereof of these recommendations. So I have a very general question in terms of the approach of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to the Auditor General's reports. Uh, to what extent do these reports influence the work and direction of the Ministry? I, I would suspect there's a, a spectrum of possibilities. One, it goes into a draw, and whenever a committee asks about it, we, we wake up. But Hopefully that's not the case. Uh, the other end, end of the spectrum is it that this forms, these reports form part of a statutory part of your senior management meetings. To what extent do these reports influence the work and direction of the ministry? Uh, is it something that simply arises when called upon by the parliament? I would hope not. So I'd want a reflection from you on, on this aspect because it, it may explain or help us understand uh, some of the delays, et cetera, that we may have experienced. Please. Um, thank you very much for that question. So the ministry, you know, reviews and we deliberate on the recommendations that would come out of the Auditor General and recommendations out of from the committees like these. Um, generally, based on the, once the recommendations are reviewed, the specific recommendations are looked at and maybe um, pursued um, based on in conjunction with other internal work that we may be doing based on our work plan or based on our strategic plan. So, for example, the things that would not have been um, accomplished for various reasons over the last three years, we are currently working on our strategic plan right now, and so therefore we are incorporating some of these um, when I look back, for example, at the, the report from the committee, and I'm just taking the minerals um, areas, some of the things we looked at um, in that process was the mineral licensing process, um, the minerals advisory committee, and generally in terms of the minerals um, industry. And based on what the things that we addressed, as I said, we sought to do things not just piecemeal, but look overall at the process. And so the minerals is just one aspect of it. We have also, with respect to the oil and gas area, where things were addressed in terms of the production verification, our systems, our staffing. 
And so when you look at the range of things that we would have done, for example, in terms of staffing, we addressed that significantly between 2019 and now in all of the areas, in the minerals division, in the um, downstream, the petroleum operations division in terms of hiring of petroleum inspectors, minerals inspectors, um, geoscientists, um, engineers, and all of that. So we try to address things, not just you know, piecemeal, but based on our overall strategy. So th they are taken seriously, and we have been implementing in a lot of different areas so that we are able to address it, not just, um, but it's sustainable, sustainable um, implementation in terms of the areas that are being recommended by the Auditor General. And that is reviewed on a monthly or quarterly basis to ensure we have our monitoring and evaluation department, and they also keep us on track in terms of that. All right, so thank you. Thank you, ma'am, yes. Other colleagues, good questions? Gentlemen, thank you. Um, I don't want to belabor the earlier point, but within this committee, because uh, it deals with the accounting, there'll be overlap from a technical committee into this committee. You, you, you understand? It? And basically, if there are gaps, there are gaps. If there's a committee um, who have been around for a long time, but there are still these basic baseline gaps, I see no reason that it shouldn't be raised here. Having said that, I'm just looking at um, the, from the Auditor General's recommendation that there be implemented a documented process for verification of production data. And I, told, I was surprised that the, the Auditor General, who is, um, is not a specialist within the ministry, had to say one needed to do something like this. Notwithstanding, um, I also observed that this production verification, there's a committee now to treat with the reviewing. Um, the question I want to ask is, uh, is basically, when you give out these licenses, and you could correct my um, language, eh? you give out the licensing, uh, there is, a, is there a process or measurement, some kind of tool of measurement, where you, you tell, or benchmark, where you tell the producer how much he has to produce, and if there is a major gap, you know, there, is, there are some kind of consequences. You know, they, they have to produce, I, I suppose, at a certain level. Do you give them a, a level at which they have to produce? Um, it's, it's not as, no, we are not able to do that simply because the production depends on the field, it depends on the geology and the ability of that field to produce. So, when the field is given out, we will have bid rounds. We will give out a particular area. We have what we call the exploration phase, which is where the company will do technical studies, seismic and drilling. And based on that, they will, the results of the seismic and the drilling will help to determine the data from that, will determine the capability of the field. What our engineers and geologists and geophysicists do is that they would, one, approve the programs in terms of the type of work that the company is doing, and they would also, on a daily basis, monitor that they, the work that's being done, and then they would also review the results, right? So we will ensure that the conclusions that the company comes to, that we agree with it in terms of what's the capability of the field. I'm giving a long yes. explanation yes. just right. so you can mm -hmm. understand. So it, that mm -hmm. varies from field to field, whether mm -hmm. it's onshore, offshore, mm -hmm. and the type of field. So we are able to gauge the ability of a particular field to produce based on a number of different things. And we have engineers and geoscientists which are assigned to specific fields and specific companies, and they monitor so that they are able to understand what the capability of the field is. So it's a, it's a continuous relationship between the staff 
and the operators. So we are not able to say that we want a company to produce 100 barrels of oil, but we will determine based on the conditions if the company is producing 100 barrels of oil, if they have the capacity to do more, or if that drops below 100, if there's anything we can do to rectify it. And that's a daily process that we go through in terms of the regulation of the industry. So I don't know if that explains it a little better. So it's not a clear-cut case that we can say, so, you know, no company X, you need to produce this or not. So, so there's no real projection, as you said, given the existing conditions. It varies. All right. Now, because I was wondering about your gap analysis, but what I'm also seeing a report that you did almost a year ago, um, some a 30th report of the of the Public Accounts Committee, and it says that um, the product verification first involves receipt of production data from the operation from the operator, sorry, production database. So is it that they have to give you the information and, and not your you don't independently kind of um, yeah. So this thing? is. So, so the, the engineers and the geologists, they will monitor the field. So they, we will have a general idea of what the capabilities of a particular field is. In that field, you will have several wells producing. Um, in a case of like on land, you may have several thousand wells producing. So the company will send the production data Right, so, so and they would send, they will group it by field, etc., and they will send that data to us. We will have a, a very good idea of the capability, of course, all of this in conjunction with the operator, based on the staff that we have monitoring the fields of what the production should be. So we are able to identify if there are issues, there may be issues in terms of um, facilities itself, or maybe in the reservoir itself, which will impact on the production. So we have two levels. We have at the professional technical level, which looks at the operation of the fields, and they will be able to give an idea, get an idea of what the production might be. But then we have at the data level, which is all of the data coming together for by field, that will come to the data staff, and they will monitor as well to see if they see any changes. So, so and this is the best mm -hmm. practice across the world. Yes, it, yes, it is. So. Yes, it is. So, yeah. so if mm -hmm. you have to analyze the gap to say, okay, mm -hmm. this person is producing below expectation because they yes. have some kind of expectation, mm -hmm. is there a penalty attached to that? There is no penalty, um, except if there is a breach of the license. Itself. Breach meaning what? what could meaning that there may be certain conditions if there is a, um, something in the, the production sharing contract or the license that is not being done, then there may be a breach in terms of the, um, if they don't fulfill work commitments. So, for example, if you have a requirement that you need to drill a certain amount of wells and you don't, um, if you don't, there may be, there's a breach of the license. But it's not a, a matter of um, if you, or there's, there's a commitment also to send data. Mm -hmm. And if you don't give that information, that's a breach of the license. Yes. Yeah. My, my last question, Jim, to you. Yeah. But in this so a verification process, do you have any independence inside of it, or is it just the ministry to the um, producer? Is, is there, do you have an like a independent assessor? Um, who no, no. Going? The ministry mm -hmm. is the one that's responsible mm -hmm. in terms of reviewing the data. So there is no, um, like an independent third party. Mm -hmm. No, there's no independent um, third party for specifically for the collection of production data. Right? We have generally, we use the independent third party will come in terms of looking overall in terms of the reserves, right? Which, as you know, we report on an annual basis. So, but that is an overall picture because they would look at the reserves and the production and give us status of where, what remaining reserves that we have. But in terms of the independent um, for 
each molecule of gas, mm -hmm. we don't have like an independent person where the independence coming is in terms of the verification of the systems and the facilities that are in place. So what we try to do is to ensure that when the systems, meaning the systems of production for your wells, the integrity of your wells and the production and the facilities are in place, that that is done with an international best practice so that when you actually have production, you can be assured that your, your production is in line <laughs> with what is expected. And so at that point in time, we will have a certified verification authority, CVA, that would do look overall at your implementation at the in infrastructure itself. That is respect to reserve, because yeah. to me that too will impact on your ability to, um, to attract investors in, into, into your, your program of, um, what do you call it, drilling, as it were, not so, the, the independence of yeah. these Yes, so we um, have assessments. several different levels. So mm -hmm. from the infrastructure side, we have engineers and we use may have third parties, experts, who will come in to ensure our systems are in place. In terms of the actual production and what we do, we have also have the petroleum engineers and the geoscientists, which verify that the wells that are drilled are the right ones, that the, you know, the programs that are done are in line with international best practice. Then we have the systems of collecting the production itself, which is just one part of it which ensures, we try to ensure that we account for the production. Then we have the actual reserves, which we take a third party for, which we'll look at another part of it. So all of these things have to all come together to ensure that, you know, we, we have to look at all of them in conjunction to make sure and we have an entire system that can stand up to scrutiny. And with that, we also have the revenue part of it, because production by, of course, your price will give you revenue. So all of those things have to come together. So it's a lot of different moving parts, but we believe, um, based on what we have looked at internationally, based on the feedback that we've had, based on our history in the industry, we believe that our systems are robust and can stand, withstand scrutiny. And even based on what the Production Verification Committee looked at internationally, our systems are in line with that. Because when we got the feedback in 2019 from this committee, um, we did a lot of research to ensure that what we are doing can, is indeed what everyone else is doing internationally. But, sorry, the Production Verification Committee sounds like something that is a little bit lumbering. Is it nimble and really um, uh, respond, in, respond within the real time? That's the last one, Chairman. The, the Production mm -hmm. Verification mm -hmm. Committee, mm -hmm. based on some of the concerns that were raised, is really um, a group of our professionals that we put together to take an in-depth look at our systems, but not just look at our systems, but also look at other jurisdictions. And they looked about at five or six jurisdictions um, internationally as well, the UK, the US, Norway, very established um, oil producing, oil and gas producing countries, just as we are, to see if what we are doing really is in line with that, and the results came back that we will. Now, it did also show that there were some systems internally that we needed to tighten up on, and we have sought to address that. One of them was the manpower, another, you know, was that. It's not that we didn't have the systems in place, but with upgrading and going into technology, we needed to put the written procedures, and that is what um, the Auditor General flagged. So we had the systems, but like for the EDH, which was implemented very recently in terms of our history, we needed to have all the documents um, available so that when the Auditor General comes in, they can see it. But it's not that the systems are not there, it's just that they weren't, the new systems were not documented. So those were action items that we had to take. So we did all of that, and we still have some more that we are looking at. You know, it's a continuous improvement. So because we want to ensure that you know that um, we we account to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, so we want to make sure that you know that 
you can understand as well as we do what is happening. So we are working on that. Thank you. Before I, I turn over to Member Sipasad, you spoke, we have been speaking about production verifications uh, committee. I am aware that they submitted a report in 2020, which was submitted to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. And a series of recommendations were made. Based on the information that I have in front of me, however, when an assessment was asked for the status of those recommendations, there were several of those items where there's a blank, there's a space. Some were in progress, some were completed, very few were in fact completed. Most of these were in progress. The question I have, ma'am, is given that we have, since 2020, this report, the, the challenge, of course, we have is that we have not gotten the feedback as to what has been accomplished and what, has, what was the status of those. And in the interest of time, I don't want to identify each one and then ask what is the status of it. But can you give an idea of whether from 2020 to now, this, the actual level of implementation or achievement of solutions given by, uh, given the queries and the, the recommendations made by that very same production verification committee. There were several recommendations made that we are aware of, but the problem is that we are not aware of what the status of those are. Okay, thank you. So, as I alluded to prior, one of the key things would have been staffing. At the time, one of the issues was the staffing in terms of the measurement, the staff dealing with the actual calibration and the measurement of the, of the meters. Um, since then, we have hired um, seven members of staff right, petroleum inspectors, in addition to the staff that we currently have, to be able to address that. So let me help you to help me. Yeah, sure. One of the recommendations was to document the process map currently in place to address discrepancies noted in production data after reconciliation. The procedure should also include means to capture response from operators when contract management division raises queries. Mm -hmm. We have no status update of that. Can you provide a status update of that specific recommendation? Right. So the actual process was documented. Done. Completed. Correct? You have another one. Consideration of expanding the audit scope to include ENP licenses. Right. The, the, we are still um, determining how to implement that in terms of the audit of the ENP licenses simply because the the revenues and so on reside with the Board of Inland Revenue, right? So that is still under consideration as to how that can be implemented. So from 2020 to now, mm -hmm. we have not made any progress with regards to the specific issue, the specific recommendation. So the, if you would allow me to sure. explain, in terms of the actual licenses itself, our contract management reviews the licenses and yes. in terms of audit, they would, so the production sharing contracts, we have an actual audit group which is responsible for that within the Ministry of Energy. But they see, they look at cost and revenue and they, because of the nature of the, the contracts, the revenues and the it is difficult with the licenses to do the same thing because of the nature of how the revenues are handled for the, for the licenses, which is under the Board of Inland Revenue. So what I'm saying is that it's not that we have not considered no, seriously. I'm, I'm aware mm -hmm. of the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the challenge I have mm -hmm. is that the Production Verification Committee is also, because it comprises members of your own team mm -hmm. who are familiar with, these, with this industry, and they would have reviewed all of that and they would have come up with a recommendation which they viewed as important enough and practical enough based on their research to undertake this exact issue that we are raising here. So you have, a, you have an expert team that would have considered the situation and said, basically, we want to expand the audit scope to include ENP licenses. And therefore, it's a practical suggestion made in 2020. 
there would be a timeline, and I expect that there would be a timeline for actually finding the methodology to so do. I'm assuming that the Production Verification Committee would have, in fact, not just made a recommendation that this is what they want to do, but provide some level of technical guideline as to how to so implement. I'm just concerned that several years have passed since the actual submission of the recommendations, which would have provided all of this information from before. But several years have passed before we have made a step forward to achieving what I, would, what I believe to be a very practical and useful goal. But time has passed. Mm -hmm. And we are still in a situation today where we are not sure how to proceed with it. Is it then, remember the mandate of the committee? The mandate of the committee is if there's a challenge identified to find ways or to, to discuss the opportunities to, find, to, to, to bridge a gap to overcome the hurdles. Is there anything that your committee on this side can recommend, or the Auditor General's department can recommend to fast track this process? Or is it that you believe that at some, at some, there's some uh, hurdle that you still need to work out so that you can, this is just one of those recommendations I'm treating with. But is, do you believe that there's a hurdle that you can yourselves as a ministry uh, overcome so that we can have the recommendations, these very worthwhile recomm recommendations, actually implemented in a timely process. So, yeah, so I just want to say that the committee did make the recommendation. We have considered it, but we are in the process of trying to determine how we can effectively implement it. All right, so no, I, I accept that. Yeah. My concern really was that it has taken three years to get to this point where we are still considering how to how to move forward part into the recommendation that was made by your own team. Um, I want to move on to a couple others, but there are several such recommendations, um, and we want to get the status of those. So, Madam Permanent Secretary, if you, if you can provide us with the recommendations and the current status, we will take that in writing, given the, in the interest of time. But if you could provide us with the recommendations and the status as at today of those recommendations, then we may be able to be in a more informed position to move forward. Is that okay, ma'am? Yes, that is. As before, can I tie you down to a time frame? Because this is current information within your hands. It's just a status update. Uh, we can provide that um, by Friday. Mm -hmm. By Friday? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Today is Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Today is Wednesday. Correct. Yeah. This Friday. That's <laughs> wonderful. I look forward. Um, Mr. Bihari, please take note. Not the, uh, no, the recommendations for the production verification. Uh, of the course, other, no, I'm, I, I'm the other just, information I'm is in the hands of the, um, the TTPS. Yeah. Similar pattern <laughs> to pursue <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Mabasi mm -hmm. Prasad, I know that you've been waiting to ask your questions. Thank you, Chairman. Madam Permanent Secretary, I'm interested in the Energy Data Hub system. Um, can you tell me who manages it and um, w have there been any challenges, hindrances in implementing the system or operating the system? So the manager of Energy Data Operations is here with me, so I'll invite her to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. So the Energy Data Hub is the responsibility of the Inf Energy Information Management and Technology Division. Um, and the only challenge we had in recent time was staffing, but we are currently in the process of populating the database. It is in use, it is in live use. Um, most of the operators are currently on stream. The ones that are not, we are in process of training um, to get them on, um, on stream and in terms of ones who have challenges, we're working with the operators to get them to submit um, their data through the Energy Data Hub and so we can move away from the hard copy submissions into the online database. Uh, when do you think you're going to have the system fully up and running? Well, the, the population, I mean, we've been in this industry for quite a long time, so the, the population of the database is happening is going to be an ongoing process. So mm -hmm. from current to now, we'll probably be able to give you some information. We have data all the way back to probably 2007, which is the most current. Um, and we are populating back um, in reverse chron um, chronological order. Um, but we are looking at maybe a timeline of about 
three years to fully populate the database from 1857 to present. And, um, but in terms of usage, we are using it currently. And um, in, you, you mentioned staffing, so you're going to be fully, um, your staff complement is going to be fully up and running in what period of time? Oh, we've, we've already started to address that. So we've we already hired some staffing, and I think um, so, um, PS is working on trying to get the full team back on stream, but we are, we are in the process of doing that. So the, the project is still ongoing. It's still ongoing. Yes. Chairman, permit me one last question. Madam Permanent Secretary, staffing was also, staffing generally was identified as an issue. How um, are you addressing that, the gaps in your staffing? Thank you very much. So we were able to make um, significant progress in terms of that. So that was one of the areas. So in all of the different areas, which would have been in energy data, in minerals, right. and with the petroleum inspectors and with the technical staff, we, so we had some permanent um, positions which we were waiting to fill. We did get some of them filled. We are in the process of interviewing for others. That's for the establishment. But what we were able to do within the three-year time frame was to get um, contract positions against those. So in the interim, we were able to fill, to get contract positions until the the establishment positions were filled. And so that has been successful. So we have taken on um, engineers, geoscientists, petroleum, as I mentioned, both sets of inspectors. And so we were able to do quite a lot in terms of the staffing over the last three years. Uh, what percentage do you think is still unfilled? In terms of the in, establishment? In, well, in terms of your overall requirements, whether it's an establishment or contract position. Um, I'll have to get the numbers, the specific numbers, but I would say maybe if we, in terms of the establishment, I would say maybe 15%, um, 15 or 20 percent. But saying so, those, um, some of those rules are the key rules, right? So mm -hmm. we have the positions that are unique to the Ministry of Energy. Um, which are IK like petroleum engineers, chemical engineers, and so on. So even though they may be small in numbers, you know, they are... Um, they matter. Yeah, they, are ma they matter. But it's a, we are in the process of doing so. But as I said, we have the contract positions, which we have been very successful in terms of having those while um, filled so that we can have the work being done while the process is um, undergoing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. Just to jump off on that question. Um, given that you have just indicated that there is a, a bit of a, a gap between the level of the employment in specific areas that you would mm -hmm. want and what currently exists, so you said maybe about 15%. I know it's a ball, it's mm -hmm. a ballpark, mm -hmm. but has that affected your ability? Because you indicated that some of it are critical individuals, mm -hmm. critical for the, the, the operations of the, the, the industry. Um, has that adversely affected the operations and your ability to operate effectively and efficiently? Mm -hmm. So we, I would say to some extent, but I would also say that the, so let me just qualify that. We also have, um, we implemented a process, a program with which we call the mentees, where we um, had, it's 2019 as well, we had a group of about 40 young persons, most of them with either first class honors um, or distinctions with masters that we've had in the process in the ministry as well. Um, we have returning scholars, we have OGTs. And so what we have, and that's why we have a lot of training as well, um, because we also have a lot of young, bright, um, staff within the Ministry of Energy, um, along with some of the seasoned professionals that we have. So what I do can say is that um, really, I mean, our staff gives all. Um, they go beyond the call and even, and I can attest like even during the COVID as well, um, we went into work from home um, practically seamlessly, you know, um, because of the use of technology and, you know, we bought laptops very quickly and so on. And so while I can say the staffing has been an issue, we use 
all of the available resources, and I have quite a lot of my staff that goes beyond the call to ensure that we get things done. All right, so um, we utilize, you know, all of the, the manpower that we have to try to achieve what we, what we have to do. Thank you very much, Madam Pierce, and commendations to your staff. I hope that you would uh, increase your staffing as required so that you could give them a bit of a, uh, well, I know that they would have been forced to perform above and beyond because of the short staffing. So hopefully that the, the increased staffing that you project will treat with some yes, of those we, we Yes, yeah, we're working very hard on that. Thank you. Thank you. May I turn over now to Member Brown? Monroe, sorry. Member Monroe, sorry. Thank you very much, Chairman. To the Permanent Secretary, Tech Secretary, sorry, could you tell this committee, based on the um, recommendations made by the Production Variation Verification Committee, that a division be assigned to audit the exploration and production licenses of the operators? Has this recommendation been fulfilled? No, no, that's I think is the same recommendation the, with respect to the audits of the ENP licenses. Yeah. No, this has not been fulfilled, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you have a timeline as to how soon this may come into play? Um, we will try to get it done within the next year, yeah. but it's not fulfilled yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, PS and team, one of the areas uh, examined by the Auditor General and reported by the Auditor General was the issue of a manpower audit uh, to determine and fortify personnel competencies within the ministry, uh, given the great importance of your mandate. Uh, keeping our lights on and everything else around us. <clears throat> and in your written response to those recommendations, there was some emphasis placed on training of senior management. I just have a few questions as a follow-up to those submissions. Uh, there was a focus on a particular type of, you know, it's highly technical, but training to enable senior management to regulate automated gauging and metering of oil stockpiles and that type of training. I'm interested in a bit more detail on this. How does the ministry go about uh, procuring such training? What is the process that you use? Who are the, for, for this training that you've referred to here, who are, who are the service providers of this training? And what is the frequency of this type of training for your senior management. I hope you are able to respond. Thank you very much. So what we would normally do is that based on notices that we would get or um, if there's a particular training, like for example in a specialized area such as you um, highlighted, we would, once if it's locally, um, so, for example, in 2023, there's some measurement training that will be held in the Hilton very often, periodically. It will come, different types of training will come to Trinidad. And therefore, we will send our staff, a group, the, whichever group is identified. If that training has not, does not come to Trinidad or is not available virtually, then we actually contact the provider and we normally get... Um, training set up within the ministry, right? So they may come specifically for the Ministry of Energy and we will get whatever is the minimum group, if it's 10 persons, 15 persons, depending on the type of training. Sometimes we invite other agencies, you know, so the state agencies as well to participate. Um, so we can actually request training as well. So I, can, I will give uh, Mr. Rudder the floor so he can specifically address the measurement. But for example, during the, the COVID period um, in 2020, we had one of the better known um, providers 
do a series of maybe about six courses um, for our young professionals, um, which took them through the entire industry from petroleum and economics, um, some of the implementation of the the more technical areas, geosciences and so on. So we had it specialized and some of it leadership, um, strategic leadership. And so we, we did that, you know, and continue to do it so that we can have from all levels of staff. And so it's one of the things we focus on. With respect to the measurement and the custody transfer, I will ask Mr. Rudder to speak specifically on what we have done. Yes, good morning. In terms of the training you were mentioning, that training was provided by an international organization. You want the name of the organization? Um, it's called Petro Knowledge. Uh, so they were providing the training online, and we I can't remember the number of persons from the, the, the uh, ministry that attended the training. I think it was about three or four persons um, attending that training. I think that was the first time we did attend that training. It was done in 2021, I believe. Um, what we, why we were interested in that particular training is because uh, one of, of the operators in Trinidad was interested in using automated um, gauging instead of manual gauging to report production to the ministry. So we wanted to find out a bit more about it through that training program. Um, that training program um, is also conducted. Um, I think it's going to be conducted this year. How we um, train up um, officers? We normally rotate our officers either on a six-month basis or a yearly basis. So we may rotate different persons, different inspectors into measurement. So they will, some of the inspectors may not have been trained that area. So um, when that training comes back again, we'll be able to train them, those who didn't go into training in that training program. All right, but there, as PS mentioned, there's another uh, training program planned for um, this year. It's gonna be in country, in Trinidad. So we normally use those kind of opportunities, if a training can be held in Trinidad, and can be held in person to send persons to those training programs. Follow-up, in, in your, again in your written, thank you for the response. In your written response, there was also a reference to uh, training or familiarization with digitization methods. And you know that's one of our, our key priority phrases in, in the country and, and region, digitization. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask um, your team, what is the, the extent, the degree of modernization? I know it's a broad question, uh, maybe for, uh, um, without going into full detail, to be able to give me a sense as to because we are very proud of our long heritage in this industry, but that would come with a certain mode of operation. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm convinced that the ministry would have been taking a number of measures to modernize and digitize its, its operations, its procedures. How far has that gotten? Are you able to give me a comment or some feedback on the degree of digitization? of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you very much for that um, question. So in terms of our, based on the nature of the, the work itself, the technical work, to a large extent, we already, so our professional staff um, already work um, in a digitized manner using very advanced, software, right, um, for their specific areas. And that goes from our GIS, um, Geographic Information Systems, to um, seismic technology, to, you know, the petroleum engineering. So in those areas, we have done quite a lot. With respect to the data itself, which is now recording, in terms of the submission, the EDH, the Energy Data Operation, the Energy Data Hub, and we are... Um, have done also the Minerals Data Hub. Um, that's already in place. What the, the challenge we have with the digitization is, is really, which is what Mr. Gale was speaking about, is putting in the information which predated the establishment of these systems. So 
Um, and that's her staff, a lot of her staff is actually doing that work in terms of putting it in. We are constantly looking at ways in which we can um, integrate other parts of the system, right? Um, so because, because we are public service and also with the petroleum industry, I know, for example, like with respect to our revenue collection, um, the Ministry of Finance is currently um, doing a lot of work in terms of, for example, making available um, the system so that revenue and checks, you know, can be disbursed and so on. So what we need now, and which is what we are working on, is how we can get the, the other parts of the systems integrated for our stakeholders, right? So in terms of payments, um, you know, being received and so on, we can make other avenues available. So which is the general public service is also working on that. So we are part of that process as well. So in terms of digitization, um, the Ministry of Energy is in a very good place. Our staff, a lot of what they work, they work from the cloud. Um, they're able to work at home or in the office, you know, and move seamlessly, um, transmit large amounts of data between the shareholders, the stakeholders in the industry and ourselves um, so that, you know, we can interface with the stakeholders um, very efficiently. So I would say we are in a very good place in terms of the digitization from the industry standpoint. There's always a lot of improvement because technology, as you know, you know, works, <laughs> improves quickly. But um, the, the aspect which we are also working with the wider public services in terms, of course, our um, registry and, you know, the admin and so on, which is where we have to make the big thrust over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Pierce. I want to turn over now to Member John. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Pierce. Um, again, Yes, I just wanted to go back a little bit to the discussion we had a little earlier because we, I suppose we are wrapping up shortly. And uh, I want to say, well, one has to accept what you have said with respect to the oversight of the production assets uh, in terms of the variables uh, that makes it not to, um, you, it not as specific uh, in, in terms of what you, could, what you could project and basically put down on, I don't know, whatever your spreadsheet in terms of this is the returns we get on this asset, as it were, because it said there are a number of other prevailing factors. Um, notwithstanding that, I, I suppose there's an engaged methodology to verify the production. And I have a question here uh, where in verifying the production, where the, how does the ministry ensure that gas losses are within the agreed limits? Because that's what I was trying to ask. If there's a plus or minus, there, you have some kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, up or down number that you say this is acceptable or, unacce or unacceptable, uh, which is, in statistics, we say is a deviation from the mean, whatever that means. The standard deviation, you see. You have to go back, I don't know, I do my finance long, long time ago, right? And, and that it's, whether it's properly dealt with as maybe stipulated, or if it is stipulated within the sale contract, if you have that deviation within the sale contract, and so on. Um, uh, one, what is the, the factors? And if it, it's internationally benchmarked, so we know we are on the right track now because everything, basically we are in a kind of global industry. Um, you, you're really in a good industry from that point of view that it doesn't allow you to go too far away from what is, I think, excellence. And you don't have to sell me on the hard work that public servants put in. I'm an advocate <laughs> for that. I know public servants work hard. Yeah. Yes, so mm -hmm. thank you again. So yeah. within the the... the the losses, the losses within the system, um, there are acceptable ranges of, um, so, okay, if you're looking at the, the, the data itself in terms of monitoring of the production, there, if there's any variation at all from the data um, submission. And that, and that is up or down variation. Up or down variation. Like there's mm. usually a note mm. which mm. will indicate a reason for it. If it exceeds, so for example, 
if you have a field that's producing regularly, so because with, with natural gas in particular, so let's use natural gas, it's a buying and selling, so it isn't stored anyway. So there must be a demand for there to be a supply, right? right? Um, sometimes the supply is limited based on what is happening with the facilities. But in our system, for example, with natural gas, for most of the natural gas, the national gas company is the aggregator. So they would also be in the system in terms of the purchasing and selling. So that's another layer in which we have the a state entity being in there because they would also be monitoring in terms of what they are receiving and what they are selling. Mm. From the Ministry of Energy standpoint, when we get the data, if there's a significant variation, either the, the data team will pick that up and they would liaise with you the pick engineers. That up quickly, real, sort of real time? E e mm. Well, within there's a, a lag in that system. Within a day or two. Okay. But in mm. terms of the real time, mm -hmm. The engineers that are within a field, that are monitoring a company, mm -hmm. would be aware of what is happening because we are in contact with the operators, right? And also, like, maybe the NGC. So if there's any change in the system in a big way, if, a, if something goes down or whatever, we'll be aware of it, right? That information will come to us. So there are several different levels at which we will monitor what's happening in terms of production. In terms of acceptable losses with contracts now, those things are written within the contracts. And your system, in terms of the infrastructure, will have losses in it based on how the system is designed. So, so is that losses yeah, so, redundancy or losses based on inefficiency? Got it. I'll turn over to Max to see if you can. Um, sometimes, like for instance, with natural gas, mm -hmm. um, if natural gas is produced offshore and it's coming onshore, mm -hmm. you may have gas dropping out, condensate dropping out of the gas. Mm -hmm. What we call condensate dropout. Mm -hmm. So it's converted from a gas to a liquid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So if somebody have losses um, along those lines, um, which um, so what in terms of what you measure offshore and what you get onshore, it may be a difference. That is shrink, we call that so, shrinkage. So it's a, yeah, right, okay. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. So all of this is to say that on a technical level, it's monitored by multiple different parties who are buying and selling, but also your contract will also have written into it what's acceptable in terms of that. So usually in the system, there are multiple places at which you can verify um, production and to determine if there are losses, right? So we have the downstream petroleum. We have a, a section which is called natural gas supply and transmission. And they look at the projections, the demand, what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, the pipelines, right? Um, then we also have in contract management, we will have the engineers who are monitoring the fields on a day-to-day -day basis. So they will be in touch with the company, and they will know if there's something major. They can report on that. Then we have the data people who get the figures. So if they pick up anything there, they would come back to us. And then we have the facilities guys who will be going out with the verification, with the calibration. Um, they would be on if there's, so we have the, you know, so there are multiple areas that we can pick up if yeah. there's something off. So I, I hope that helps. <laughs> so, um, so there's, yeah, so what you call the redundancy. Yes, mm -hmm. It wouldn't be the same data, mm -hmm. but we will tend to pick up areas. If you miss it in one, you mm -hmm. should be able to get it mm -hmm. somewhere else to know that something is not right. So, okay, so the system yeah. kind of regulates itself in a way, right? Well, you know, it, you know, it regulates. Kind of, uh, so all of this is regulation. All of this is uh, within the ministry. And uh, then, as I said, we have with natural gas, you have NGC in there as well. So, you know, and so it's a, it's a whole moving system that, um, that tends to, um, so it doesn't regulate itself, but we regulate it in multiple different ways and in different areas. Okay. Last that's question, the question. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask, given this, um, has there ever been losses um, or has 
Yes, sir. I have a question here. Have, a gas, have gas losses ever proven to be a major source of revenue leakage? But I guess that, pro, pro, that question is redundant because if, it's, if you have gas losses, it, you will have revenue le leakage. But gas losses will come about because of what? Faulty equipment or faulty reporting for overestimation? Um, there are a number of different... So what I'm saying, the system is built in such a way, so, so it's very technical as well, right? Mm -hmm. So the producers, on one hand, they are producing, mm -hmm. and they would be measuring what they are producing. Then you have the transmission, which is along the pipelines, mm -hmm. right? Most of the pipelines is NGC. So they would be monitoring what's happening. Then you have those who are purchasing on the other end, right? The mm -hmm. plants who are purchasing mm -hmm. will ensure that they are getting what they are being paid for, mm -hmm. right? So if there are losses along the way, it depends on the type of contract. It will determine how that is um, accounted for. Mm -hmm. So all of it will not necessarily come back to government because some of it, the buyers and the sellers will deal with that mm -hmm. if, if they make it up later on, if they, even if you don't get it, you still have to um, pay for it, right? So it depends on the source of it. So the, the system, you know, it's written in terms of um, the equations, there may be boil off, <laughs> you know, there, so there are a number of different ways. So, so that's why we need the technical staff there who understands what's happening in the system to be able to get in there. And we do have the staff that's there, and as I said, with natural gas, which is where a lot of our revenue come as well, we have the engineers, um, we have NGC there, we have, um, you know, on shore, um, for, we have the heritage is there, you know, with the lease ups and so on. So there are a number of different areas that we, um, that we, we work with in terms of ensuring that you know we where the losses are we can identify them and then you know who is supposed to pay for it will pay for it and so on yeah. very well thank you peters mm. our colleagues do you have any more questions i just have a couple more just before we wrap um, i have a question from a member of the audience who um, messaged me directly uh, having trained staff having spent all this money training staff um, and this ties into something i read somewhere in one of the documents before, that you have staff on one-year contract and you're not trying to migrate staff to three-year contracts, but having trained staff, what mechanism, and this is, a, this, is a highly, this is a highly competitive and highly technical areas, and a substantial amount of money is being spent to train staff. How do you ensure that the staff that you spend a substantial amount of money training are kept within your, your arms so that you don't have to continuously train new staff and lose them to somebody else? Um, thank you very much. So that is, um, of course, an area which, since I joined the, the ministry um, 25 years ago, you know, that is uh, because in, within the industry, not just the ministry, there is a trend where people move, right? And um, it's, it's just um, part of the way. So what we try to do, of course, within the Ministry of Energy is to, of course, create, make sure we have work itself that's um, engaging, and we try to create an environment that would make it conducive for the professional development, you know, in terms of the employees there. So some of us stay, like I have stayed, Mark would have stayed, you know, Candice. So there are a group of us, you know, there are people who as well want to serve the country and you know would stay in the ministry and we have quite a large group of that so we we try to ensure that um we have an environment and training and challenging work that will keep persons but also we try to also ensure that we get better um benefits and um, to see how competitive we can be within the limits of the public service you know that um could avoid us losing staff, but we do lose staff. I lost um, a member of staff last year, and I told him, I said, if it was my own company, you know, I would increase your salary so I can keep you. But, you know, of course we have um, limitations. But we do our best with the, within the remit that we have, within whatever um, authority we have. 
and flexibility to ensure that our staff um, remain. But we have very good staff, and so therefore, you know, the the opportunities will come from other companies, other areas for them to go. So yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Permanent Secretary. I want to give um, both the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries a one minute. Uh, wrap up as we are wrapping up now, but uh, your parting words, please, ma'am. Yeah, so thank you very much again. I just want to apologize for not responding to the company, um, but it is not for lack of wanting to, but um, certainly because there is just so much that we, we need to get done on a daily basis. And I just want to assure you that... Um, you know, we are working really to ensure that both for the revenues and, you know, in terms of ensuring that the benefits of the industry, um, not for now, but for the future as well, redound to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we will continue to do our very best and we will also ensure that we improve in terms of um, timeliness and response to this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Permanent Secretary and members from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. I want to use the opportunity as well to give the representatives from the Auditor General's Department, um, since we didn't give them much work today, I want to give them the opportunity to leave us with some parting words, uh, suggestions and queries that you may also want to extend to the Ministry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Auditor General Department notes the points raised in this meeting especially the award of the drone contract, the minerals regularization, regulations revision, the human resource issues address, the calculation of the volumes of oil produced, especially the work of the Production Verification Committee, the overview of field management, licenses, and the digitization, which will form part of the work program for this year. The audit of the 2021-2022 appropriation account has been done, has been reviewed right now. The Auditor General's Department is working to assess the overall integrity of the revenue streams of the energy and mineral industries of our nation and the general operations of these industries, bearing in mind the tolerance levels within these industries with respect to calculations and calibration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, so that it falls to me on behalf of the committee, members of the committee, to thank you all very much for your participation here, both the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries and the Auditor General's uh, Department. Um, it has been, in fact, a very informative um, discussion, and I hope that we will keep to our commitments that uh, information will come a little bit uh, easier, given the critical role that the Ministry of Energy plays energy and energy industry, please, to the country as a whole and to our gross domestic product generally. Um, I also want to use this opportunity to thank members of the viewing audience for participating, for getting involved in our process here so that we can also share information with you and for the questions that would have come uh, from the viewing audience. Um, thank you all very much for your presence and for tuning in, members of the viewing audience. Um, I would now like to have uh, the officials excused and we will go back to the in-camera session. Thank you very much.